Toronto Island Summers, Chapter 1, Death in the Lagoon. All along, the docks and breakwaters of the Toronto Island were places that could be deadly to a boy or girl who fell in the water. So we were taught to swim when we were very young and often reminded of the danger of drowning as we grew up. Be careful around the lagoon was a warning we heard many times. When my cousin fell off the Wards Island ferry dock while looking at a duck, the pantaloons of his sailor suit kept him afloat just long enough for my father to reach down and pull him out by his belt. Not all mishaps ended so well. One year, a teenager was washed off the eastern gap in a spring storm. His body bobbed on towards Island Beach a few days later. Early in the 20th century, the Ward family provided life-saving services to the island community that carried their name. They pulled shipwreck survivors out of the lake, day sailors out of the bay, and children out of the lagoons, rescuing people with their bare hands, their courage and their ability to endure cold, rough water. For years, they responded to an old ship's bell, rowing out in the day or night in a lifeboat that had washed off a freighter in a storm. Later, the harbor police assumed responsibility for the safety of island residents, their signals familiar to bay pilots and islanders alike. One of these alarms was repeated blasts from the ferry, a notice that the master of the William Inglis the Sam McBride or the Thomas Rennie needed assistance out on the bay. Since the trip from the city is only about 15 minutes from dock to dock, these carried an urgency that was always noticed along the island shores. Most times they were a false alarm. A missing child who had wandered into the ferry bathroom, or some teenagers wallowing around a dumped albacore or fin good swimmers paddling around a sailboat that couldn't sink. Other times the blasts announced a matter of life and death, even failure and despair. It was only when I was older, about ten, that I learned more about this from my island friends. Those blasts mean somebody has fallen off the ferry, they told me. Fallen off the ferry, I thought? How could anyone do that? The upper decks of those old boats were surrounded by four-foot rails, and their lower cabins were enclosed by sliding ports. The only danger on an island ferry was falling down the companionway when a skipper misjudged his throttles and ground into the dock tires on a windy day. It's when a man has jumped, Ricky explained, killed himself by jumping over the rail into the bay. And when they jump, they go right down because they don't want to keep on living. Then the ferry sounds those blasts. Ricky and Colin watched me closely as I considered this frightening and complicated idea. Taking one's own life? What a thought! Even grown-ups didn't like to consider that. I never watched the dark water pass under the bow of the ferry the same way again. Other emergencies on the island were not so grievous, even though they resulted in tragedy. Sometimes they happened right in our backyards. One of these began when I was fishing with my friends on the ferry dock on a sunny afternoon, watching my line for the telltale circles that told me a perch or silver bass was interested in my worm. Squatting in the sun, daydreaming about the lake, I looked up to see the harbor police launch heading toward us at full throttle, big waves breaking from its stern. I rubbed my eyes to make sure I wasn't dreaming, then heard the wail of its siren. The Harbies are coming, I called. We reeled in our lines. Jimmy dumped our perch pail into the bay and we jumped on our bicycles. As the police motored toward us, we rode along the gravel road, guessing the emergency was nearby. Sure enough, 
The long brown launch roared onto the calm water of the lagoon, causing the dragons and sharks of the Queen City Yacht Club to bob violently in its wake. Pedaling past our backyard fence, we rode to the top of the Algonquin Bridge, dropped our bicycles on the old brown boards and peered over the rail to watch the lifesavers pass below. I saw the shining fittings on their boat, the uniformed skipper grim-faced and intent, his radio squawking as a police diver zipped himself into a rubber suit. In the open cockpit their equipment was carefully arranged, coils of white rope, piles of red and black blankets, tanks of oxygen, boxes of medicine, orange preservers filled with kapok. A cloud of exhaust throbbed from the diesel engines as the launch passed beneath us, island children and adults standing open-mouthed along the bridge rail, every one of us reassured to see these strong men and their equipment responding to this emergency. A hundred feet along the Algonquin shore, their boat slowed near a dock already surrounded by island firemen. Two of them stood chest-deep in the murky water. The fire truck was parked on the avenue nearby its engine idling. As the police boat maneuvered into position, its skipper pointed to a spot in the weeds and his diver somersaulted into the water and bubbles began bursting on the surface of the lagoon. Ripples of speculation passed among the spectators on the bridge. They're searching for him now. He couldn't swim. They have the scuba gear. You can see where the diver goes. I looked up at the clouds over the Algonquin trees, the leaves of the poplars and willows limp in the dead air as people beside me whispered and pointed, fearing the worst. Some adults wondered aloud if there was anyone down in the water at all. Just when it seemed the diver was not going to find anything, his head broke the surface with a sudden, surprising splash, and he started towards shore, towing something that caused the teenage girl beside me to let out a gasp. As he paddled toward the beach, I saw it clearly. A ragged form rolling in the weeds. Brown water sloshing around its hands and face. Clothing fluttering around it in the dangerous water of the lagoon. He hefted the body into the shallows and the firemen pulled it onto the beach. One of the men knelt down and blew into its mouth. Though all of us, island children and adults, suspected this was of no use. Eager to see more of the spectacle, we jumped on our bicycles and rode down the bridge, annoying adult onlookers as we approached the police. Because we were island children, we assumed we would be allowed to ride into the middle of the life-saving operation. But an officer in green rubber boots held out his hand. Nothing to see here, boys, he lied. Move away. Move away? But his face was set and his manner firm. Under stairs of disapproval, we retreated, even though we knew the adults were every bit as curious as we were to see the dead men. We pedaled along Ojibwe Avenue, ditched our bicycles and hopped fences to get into the Lawton's front yard so we could watch the prohibited spectacle from there. I looked past the puffing fire truck and saw the fire and police officers talking to each other. He's dead, Ricky whispered. They can't bring him back now. To confirm this, a fat man in a dark suit walked to the beach, knelt beside the body, and opened his little black bag. He conducted his examination in a way that could only come from someone who had seen death many times, and knew a great deal about the ways it arrived, coming to people from failures in their hearts, brains, or guts, or episodes of illness, rage, heartache, or plain old bad luck. All eyes were on him as he placed his stethoscope on the drowned man's chest, lifted his arm, then felt his wrists. He looked carefully at the man's hands and fingernails, then leaned down so his cheek was an inch or two above the motionless blue lips. And after several seconds, an interval in which the life or death of the man on the sand was decided, he struggled to his feet and walked to the sergeant of police. The shaking of his head told the tale. We craned over the fence to get a better look, and one of the firemen caught us staring. Without reproach or emotion, he covered the body with a red blanket and instructed his subordinates to lift it onto a litter. 
The doctor pointed at the lagoon and the police launched nose to the end of the dock so the dead man could be taken aboard. He's going back to the city, said Colin. That's where they get buried, said Ricky. After the body had been put in the Harvey boat, the firefighters put their equipment back in their truck and raked the sand beside the dock. We bicycled to the top of the bridge and leaned over its rail to watch the dead man pass below. On the lagoon, waves from the launch rippled over the square timbers of the bridge and rocked the QCYC boats after it had passed. Now all that remained were a few adults talking quietly, looking at the sand and water, their faces grave. We realized there was nothing more to see, so we rode full speed to our fort in the Algonquin wilderness. Huddled under a collection of branches and cardboard sheets, we questioned and corrected each other. The man drowned, and now he's dead. They'll put him in a coffin. They'll bury him in the city. They'll have a funeral for him, though. Don't forget that. Probably couldn't swim. Maybe somebody pushed him. What about that? That means he was murdered. What about that? Who was he? No one knew. All we knew was that he was dead, drowned in the lagoon. We made a pact to camp in the fort that night and go down to the dock at midnight. A dead man's ghost will come out at twelve on the first night of his death, someone declared, and everyone else agreed. We would camp out and go back and see the ghost of the corpse. In our fort of old branches and boards, we all became silent then, remembering the white hands and face being turned over in the water. I decided it was time to go home and tell the whole story to my mother. But before I could act on this impulse, Ricky crawled outside and stood up. I'm going swimming in the cut, he declared. And anyone who doesn't come is a suck. He pulled off his t-shirt and trotted down the path toward the water. We followed him to our sandy beach on the Snake Island Channel. When Ricky got to the shore, he grabbed the rope hanging from our old willow and ran around it, swinging out over the water, letting out a yell as he fell in with a splash. On the bank, we waited for him to come up. Several seconds passed, but he did not appear. We quickly became quiet and looked anxiously at each other and the water, wondering if something had gone wrong. And just when it seemed it had, Ricky's head broke the surface with a sudden, surprising splash, and he turned to us and laughed. Ha <laughs> ha! Bet you thought I was dead! Ha <laughs> ha! And one after another then we followed him in, running around the old tree, swinging as high as we could, and falling deep and paddling back to the surface, shouting and laughing at each other, and laughing at the dark water of the lagoon.